It's another beautiful Sunday afternoon. Welcome to Ask the, Pedi uh, the Pediatrician. And of course, I'm your host, Nelson Zulu. Now, today on the program, we want to take a look at um, uh, another particular disease that also affects children, and this is uh, malaria. And of course, my guest on the show today is uh, Professor James Chibeta, who is a, a professor of pediatric and uh, clinical immunology from a UTH, uh, that is a Children's uh, Hospital. He's going to help us really understand the effects of uh, malaria in children and of course how fetal malaria is in children and what are some of the basic signs that might show that your child has uh, malaria. Professor Chipeta, thank you so much for coming through today and of course good afternoon. Thank you very much Nelson, good afternoon. Thank you so much. To start with, uh, give us the, the general um, distribution of malaria here in Zambia. How is it? Good. I think it's very important to relate the burden of malaria in Zambia as we see also worldwide. We know that 40% uh, of the world is, uh, is at risk of malaria, meaning that uh, in the latest uh, stat statistics worldwide, about 300 million cases of malaria are reported that cause close to 1 million deaths. Here in Zambia, the past you know, uh, few years, we have had a decline in terms of malaria in, in some you know, places. For example, here in Lusaka province, malaria is quite low. Um, uh, in, so in southern province, even much lower. Um, but we still record, you know, in a year, about five, five million cases of malaria and close to about 2,000 deaths annually. Now, the uh, most important thing, and that's why I think we really thank you for, you know, inviting us as pediatrician, is that the majority of these cases, or the most, you know, uh, affected population are children, and especially the under five children, or the children whose ages is below five years. And if we look at the burden in terms of that population, it really tops. So roughly, you know, our population is about 16 million, just over 16 million. And we know about 46% of the Zambian population is children below the age of 15 years. And if you look at the under five you know, uh, uh, years of that population, about 20% of our population is under five. Meaning roughly, you know, uh, three million or thereabout of our under five children are prone to malaria. And the burden is such that uh, um, if you talk about that, about roughly three million children that are at risk at, or at a higher risk of, uh, of malaria, we are talking about in average from our statistics from the health information management system that these are actual records that we collect from all our health facilities countrywide. We're talking about 756 you know, under five children in every 1,000 of those under five children suffer you know, from malaria. So this is how the burden is. We still have provinces where malaria is still very, very high, you know, uh, especially in Northwestern province, Rapura province, Northern province, even Eastern. The only two provinces where malaria is really you know, dramatically gone down is southern province and Lusaka. And these are the provinces that are giving us an indication that actually we can, you know, stem down malaria and actually eliminate malaria from the country. So this is the picture in short, Nelson, uh, and viewers that I want to emphasize about this current situation in malaria. Malaria still is one of the top 10 causes of, you know, us as a population visiting a, a health facility, or in case of children being sick. And we are saying in Zambia, roughly about, you know, every five cases, one case will be of malaria in the, you know, in the under five. Getting to, still talking about malaria, yeah. how does it present itself, especially in children? Good, I think that is a very important question because uh, most times, if we don't notice or detect the signs and symptoms of malaria early enough, we waste time and the consequences can be very disastrous. 
the most and almost always, you know, a uh, symptom uh, that a child that suffers from malaria will present is fever or body hotness. Uh, now, just from that itself, you can realize, you know, that it becomes very difficult because in children, fever may not necessarily be just malaria. Many other things can cause it, fever in children, especially the under five. They are prone to uh, flus, upper respiratory tract infection. They are also prone to, you know, uh, uh, urinary tract infection. Uh, their urinary system can get infected easily, and so they will have fever. They're prone to pneumonia. They're prone to many other causes of fever, acute diarrhea disease and all that. But malaria usually will present as the chief symptom of fever. But also in children, you know, they may have, you know, headache. But unfortunately, the very young ones might not complain of headache. They're young. Okay, they may have vomiting, and vomiting is very relatively common in children when they have malaria. They abdominal upset, and so they vomit. Uh, in the very young ones, you find a child who was very much active and active, usually toddlers, you know, the young, two years, three years, they're running up and down. But suddenly you find this child is not active. Okay, they are totally weak. Okay, and that uh, is a sign or symptom, you know, suggesting malaria. But they might also, in the severe cases, have all sorts of signs that are would call generally, you know, for picking them up as danger signs. They might totally have, you know, restlessness. They might feet have convulsions. Uh, they might. Uh, even uh, faint or uh, be unconscious like in case of cerebral malaria. So sometimes they might even, although not very so much common in children, they might have even jaundice, yellowness of eyes if the malaria has gone so much as to affect their liver so badly or the blood. You know, so. so you can see the symptoms are so many and quite a good number of these, they also mimic other conditions. Interesting. How do children, especially those who are under the age of five, become exposed to malaria? Yeah. So that is again is another very good question, and I think it's uh, it's important that each one of us, as parents or as you know, older people who look after children, to be aware of what can or what are the factors that would you know uh, expose or make a child you know easily get. Uh, infected. Of course, basically we know that malaria is a parasitic disease that is transmitted by mosquito. Okay, so they will get mosquito bite, and this mosquito is a mosquito that has bitten another person who could have been suffering from malaria and has carried the parasite and deposited it to a child who is exposed. So. Um, any child that is not protected from mosquito bite, they will definitely, you know, uh, uh, get beaten and therefore catch malaria. And so the, what makes a child susceptible to malaria is the very fact that, uh, you know, they will be exposed. In this case, we're talking about not less sleeping in mosquito net, not being in a house, which is what we've encouraged countrywide, uh, that is say sprayed with uh, uh, insecticide against you know um, mosquitoes um, but particularly also um, the very fact for the under five they are prone to be easily you know be susceptible to malaria in the sense that their body defense or the immune system is still not developed to protect them adequately you know from the uh, infection and so the children, by the fact that they are under five, they have their immunity not yet well developed. They are very, very prone to, you know, uh, getting malaria. Interesting. To all our viewers, uh, for all those, uh, to all those who might actually have questions, and of course uh, you'd want to get help from uh, Professor Chipeta, you can definitely come through via the number that is on our screen there, 0955-5070, 0955-5070. Professor, how fertile is malaria in children? Yeah. 
So that, that I think, again, is a very important uh, uh, fact that we need to be aware. Malaria in children is very, very, I would say, very, very dangerous and, of course, very fatal. Uh, the reason why it's so dangerous, so fatal, is that in a child, when one, a child is infected with malaria, they can easily progress or worsen from just having simple and complicated malaria to complicated malaria. Why? Children will tend easily because of the malaria infection, you know, have their, you know, blood go low in terms of the hemoglobin. So they will easily be pushed to having anemia and severe anemia. And because of severe anemia, they can easily go into, you know, um, congestive cardiac failure and eventually actually even die. On the other hand, again, uh, children can easily progress from having just an complete malaria to a malaria that affects their brain, which is what we call cerebral malaria. They'll start feeding, they'll eventually become, uh, uh, go into coma, uh, and become unconscious, and if not intervened, definitely again they die. The other aspect again is that uh, children when they have malaria, because of what we've just talked about, their immunity being not so strong, the disease becomes so devastating that it can affect not only the blood, you know, circulation in terms of anemia, but no, only just the brain, but it can also affect the kidneys and they can easily go into kidney failure and again die. Again, because of the nature of the children, when you have malaria, you know you have high fever, you have body haughtiness, and you tend to lose a lot of, you know, fluid through, pers you know, uh, uh, perspiration, uh, sweating and all that. And children easily can go into, you know, loss of their uh, fluid loss in the body, or what we call dehydration, hypovolemia, and they can go into you know, hypovolemic shock. And the malaria itself causes that pooling of blood easily because of the nature of the parasite, the type of toxin the parasites sheds in the bloodstream and they go into, you know, uh, hypovolemic shock and all that. And again, they can die. Because again of malaria, especially in children who are less than one year, they will tend to have high fever and they will tend to feed. Or they can just even convulse because the par parasite has compromised their blood sugar, they become hypoglycemic and fit. And you know that each fit that a child has, whose brain is still growing, that endangers the brain or makes that brain be susceptible to damage. And the children eventually in life might, if they recover from such a severe uh, uh, episode of malaria, they might end up being prone to, have, to developing epilepsy. They might you know, tend to be prone to develop uh, a brain, you know, uh, syndrome in terms of damage that we call cerebral palsy, meaning you have a child that cannot walk, a child that cannot move, uh, actually a lame child, just because, you know, uh, at an early stage they had an episode of, uh, of mal severe malaria and cerebral malaria and recovering from cerebral malaria, but leaves them with it these residue complications in terms of the, at the uh, brain damage level. So that's how dangerous and how fatal uh, malaria in children is. Okay. Ella, you talked about, you know, jaundice. Is there any connection between jaundice and malaria? Yes, there's very much direct, you know, connection of between jaundice and malaria. Though, as I said, that uh, jaundice is uh, not so much a common uh, uh, symptom of malaria in children, but it can happen. And the connection is that when a person or you have malaria, the parasite actually invades your red blood cell. And the red blood cell, you know, naturally when the red blood cell is old, the body gets rid of it. And it gets, the body gets rid of the, you know, of a red blood cell by actually destroying it or uh, denaturing it into its various components. And one component, which is part of the hemoglobin, 
is that you know gives out when the red blood cell is broken into what we call bilirubin, which really is a yellow staining uh, body uh, chemical that is as a result of breaking down red blood cells. Now, when you have malaria, your red blood cells are invaded by the parasite, and the body detects such a distorted, you know, uh, red blood cells, you know, as some sort of odd that ought to be destroyed. But also, just the burden of the parasite, you know, being housed in the red blood cell makes the red blood cell, you know, rupture, break out, and the breaking of the red blood cells means then you have this, you know, yellow staining uh, chemical be in the bloodstream, and then you have high bilirubin, bilirubin, and that's what stains then your body, you know, tissues yellow, especially the eyes become yellow, and the skin can also become yellow. If I, if, if I followed you so well, you talked about sometimes malaria can actually go extreme and of course can even, uh, you know, develop into other complications as well. Yeah. What are the chances that if a malaria in a child reaches to that point, the child can actually be cured? Well, so that's, I think, why we need to, to emphasize that um, unlike these other uh, childhood diseases that, you know, may be incurable, malaria is very much curable. Okay, so all what it uh, matters is how early to detect it, these signs and symptoms that we have just uh, discussed. And once you, you know, detect early and the child is taken to a health facility and attended to, you know, the destructiveness of the malaria infection can be reversed. First and foremost, uh, is that they are available drugs uh, that actually clears the malaria. I hope that mosquito is not <laughs> carrying malaria. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, is that the uh, you know the the the, 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 the are drugs, okay, both in uncomplicated malaria cases as well as complicated, which is severe malaria, that clears the parasite from blood. Uh, stream from sec you know from the body uh, once it's promptly given uh, so through prompt treatment by you know and malaria you know uh, therapy the you know the those danger you know complications can be averted can be prevented but also I also talked about the other side complication that ensures alongside just the malaria infection itself because you can go into uh, fever, okay? And fever in children easily makes them, quite a good number of them, fit, okay? But not only that, the malaria infection can lead into low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. All that again is very uh, correctable. So when a child is attended to if we see that the child already was going towards uh, being hypoglycemic, we give them, you know, replacement for glucose to correct the hypoglycemia. If we see that the child, you know, was actually getting dehydrated or their they uh, blood flow is low, we push them up with it, you know, fluids to correct the, uh, the uh, dehydration and the hypoglycemic shock. And so each of those, what would call complications when a child gets malaria or anyone gets malaria, if they are detected early, they can either be reversed, corrected, or actually prevented. So it's very, very, not only the malaria is, uh, infection is curable, but also the, its complications are treatable and can be reversed and can be prevented. One of the most common ways, especially used by many parents, mothers, and fathers to denote whether the child has got uh, malaria or not is the fever. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they would pat the child on the neck, the head, and you'd find that sometimes the body temperature is high and so on and so forth, and they might perhaps conclude to say, I think this child has got malaria, this child has got fever, and so on and so forth. 
um, the most common practice is that you'd find that parents would rush, get caffeine or get Panadol and administer to the child. Is that advisable, especially when the, the body temperature is high and the child seems to have fever? Good. I think Nelson, you've really done well to highlight that aspect. I mean, every parent or every guardian, every caregiver is very much worried and you do what exactly what you have said and most will do that. But we, we encourage that actually when a child gets sick, let's not rush for self-treatment. For the very reasons I've told you that that fever could be something else. Especially if, you, let's say you are here in Lusaka where malaria is low, uh, you may be not treating, you know, malaria might be actually wasting time for another, you know, maybe totally dangerous disease like, let's say, meningitis or so, okay? Of course, when you are in places like Wapula, or Eastern Province, Northwestern, where malaria is still very high, the chances are maybe three quarters, yes, it's malaria. But even in those situations, it's better to early when you detect fever that you suspect could be malaria or anything else, rush to the hospital. Why? Yes, the chief symptom of malaria is fever, but it has to be confirmed by a, a blood prick and test for malaria, or what we call now a rapid test for malaria, which is within 15 minutes, you do a test and you check and confirm that it is malaria. So that's really the advice that would give that when a child develops fever that is suspected of malaria or any of the symptoms that we, we discuss that are, you know, uh, quite associated with malaria, it's better you take that child, seek, you know, uh, medical help so that it can be confirmed by testing for malaria and then be treated appropriately. Yeah. And the other thing also is that uh, in children, we are very much particular of giving appropriate dose for a child. And the dose for a child is usually, you know, estimated from their age, but also from their weight. And it would be better than uh, that, you know, uh, ma malaria therapy be, you know, advised or be prescribed by a health worker than self-prescription at home. 0955 uh, 5070 that is uh, the text line uh, that you're using to obviously interact with us so you can forward your questions and uh, Professor Chipeta should be here to respond to that. Remember he is the Professor of uh, Pediatrics and uh, Clinical Immunology at UTH, at Children's Hospital. So very, very qualified in this particular area of concern. Now, Professor, mm -hmm. when you are explaining the distribution of malaria mm -hmm. uh, here in Zambia, mm -hmm. you've given two particular examples, Lusaka and Luapola. Mm -hmm. Lusaka currently, according to statistics, it has got low rate of malaria distribution as compared to other provinces. Yeah. But something that really confuses people quite a lot is that we have quite a lot of mosquitoes in Lusaka, especially currently. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of mosquitoes in Lusaka. Mm -hmm. So now, how do, we, how do we come to the variation that you talked about? Do we look at the, you know, the breeding of mosquitoes? or there are other factors that we put into consideration for us to come up with those statistics? Yeah, good. So I think that's a very good observation and very good question. So that's one fact that we need to know. Mosquitoes are actually everywhere, worldwide. You can fly to America, you find a lot of mosquitoes in some suburbs and all that. Uh, but they are free from malaria because they have eradicated malaria in the human horse. Okay, so there is no one sick with malaria so that the mosquito that bites them can pick the parasite and then, you know, deposit it on the next person. That's how the malaria in terms of infection is perpetuated. So what is happening here in the country now is that, you know, unlike in the 80s, the 90s, where almost everywhere malaria was almost at the same type of rate, is that some of our regions have managed 
to you know reduce the uh, uh, incidence of malaria meaning we have in populations that are or have less malaria in circulation and therefore you know the incidence of malaria is not there despite the fact that mosquitoes are still there for example one very very good example is in Livingston I think two past two years or so some of those hotels in Livingston there were swarms of mosquitoes but I went to Mukuni village one of my fellow health worker there a clinical officer who was posted there uh, in 2014 and I went there 2016 for two years that lady the clinical officer at Mukuni village clinic had never seen a single case of malaria and we counter checked in the clinic records indeed no case of malaria and actually, on average, it is said that uh, southern province, in terms of incidence of malaria, has at least about 26 per 1,000 population. Whereas places like uh, northern province is close to 931 per 1,000, meaning nearly everyone is it, having, <laughs> you know, uh, um, malaria. Uh, in other places like, uh, you know, uh, Northwestern province, in terms of under five, we even go above 1,600 per 1,000, meaning you have double episodes of the population having malaria and that. So, in those places, because the incidence of malaria is high, even the mosquitoes that are there, the majority of those mosquitoes will be infected by the parasite, and therefore they become inf infective. While here in Lusaka, despite the mosquitoes that you know, might be here, very few of them will be infected by the parasite, and therefore they are not in infectious in that sense. So that's why, yes, we have a lot of mosquitoes in Lusaka, but uh, they are not carrying, most of them are not carrying the parasite, and therefore most of us, if we, even if we are beaten, we are not getting sick with malaria. You're still watching Ask the, the, the Pediatrician, and of course, our topic of discussion today is malaria. And uh, Professor Chipeta is my guest on the program here, helping us really understand um, malaria and, of course, how fatal it is, especially in children as well. Mr. Darlington, in Livingstone, I'm sure that your question has been asked, uh, has been answered rather, because you wanted to know how come Livingstone has got a lot of mosquitoes, uh, yet health workers are telling you that Livingstone has no malaria. And that is the same situation that has been uh, presented here in Lusaka, where we have mosquitoes around, and yet Lusaka has got close to zero uh, malaria cases being reported as we speak. And that is the point that Professor Chipeta has been explaining. So hopefully that it's uh, clear. Now, obviously, before we go for a break, uh, mm. uh, Professor, yeah. um, uh, one of the text messages here mm. uh, wanted to find out exactly why is it that mosqui uh, mosquitoes and malaria mm. is uh, so common during the dry season? Oh. That should be a very interesting observation. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, realize that that's the case. But actually, the case is the other way around. Okay, we tend to have malaria. Of course, in Zambia, is uh, uh, is uh, there every time of the year. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we tend to have peak during the uh, peak malaria season, uh, which is coinciding with also during the rainy season okay so throughout the can uh, throughout the year malaria is is incidence is there but when it comes about february march april may especially april may we have peak season of uh, cases of malaria okay just at the time when the rain season is also like just telling you know down then also we have the, you know uh, the peak of malaria season we have more episodes of malaria. The, re the reason is simple, because the humidity and wetness tends to favor breeding site for mosquitoes. Okay, the mosquitoes need where they can breed, 
okay so the puddles of water in terms of the rain season and all of that especially in the backyard of our communities and all that are a good breeding site for mosquitoes and if we have cases of malaria individuals who are carrying the parasite those mosquitoes would easily then have you know high burden of uh, the parasite and therefore more infectious and so we tend to have during the you know the rainy uh, season to have the peak of malaria but of course there could be you know many other times if ever if anyone has really observed that uh, during the dry season in, fa in, fa <laughs> in fact it has even specified to say uh, for example in uh, Chitanda chief dome mm -hmm. yes so it seems like there's more cases in Chitanda chief dome during the dry season as compared to the other okay. parts of the season I, I, I need to go and check with the statistics but really if, uh, the trend is that we have peak season of malaria around March April May mm -hmm. okay which is just a, at the peak also the when the rain season is just going you know at most and then comes down okay so we have a bit of heat as also wetness which is very good for a breeding site for mosquitoes and as we said they are the ones that are you know uh, transmit malaria and once and as long as they're they're infected with the parasite yeah so when they breed so much it means also they can you know transmit uh, malaria so much yeah. 13.30 is the time and of course you're still, uh, you still watching Ask the Pediatrician and of course uh, we're just about to take a break. When we come back, we want to look at uh, the diagnosis of malaria and of course uh, malaria treatment as well. Then from there, we would also want to get into the prevention of malaria and I would also want to find out from Professor about the indoor residue spray program as well. How effective is it when it comes to the eradication of uh, malaria in uh, in our communities as well so stay tuned make sure that those text messages keep on coming and uh, professor chipeta will be uh, right here just to make sure that he responds to them we take a break we bring you the best music videos all genres every day 12 hours to 13 30 on your favorite channel qtv Goma. Goma, every day, twelve hours to thirteen thirty. Meet the Bundas. The Bundas are a typical modern family, and just like you, they always need to be connected. You see, Mr. Bunda needs rock-solid internet to share files with the office. But with his home broadband, syncing can take hours. And video conference calls? Forget it. Chama just wants to download his favorite show, but he may grow old before that happens. And Gran? She just wants to get to level 20. Their home connection is useless when everyone's online. And when the weather turns bad or the power goes off, the bundas are left disconnected. High Fibronics brings the best fiber internet to your home. Unlike outdated ADSL, which shares your old unreliable copper phone line, High Fibronics uses a dedicated high-speed fiber cable. This runs underground straight to your home, making it resistant to lightning and weather. If fiber's already available in your area, we'll connect you within days and with minimal disruption. High Fibronics is capable of speeds up to 100 megabits per second to and from your home, with room to upgrade in the future. Forget buffering, interruptions and delays. Get awesome uninterrupted service all the time, letting you do what you want online when you want. You deserve to live like this. Go to www.highalive.co.zn or call 255037. We love local. All of your favorite Zambian is. Maria, 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 Maria,
And much more. Z Rampage, Fridays 9 to 12 on QFM. Thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, the number for your interaction with us is the one on your screen. So keep those text messages coming and uh, Professor Chipeta will be there just to respond to some of them. And remember that so many, re so many you know, statistics and researches have actually been done on uh, malaria. And uh, much of the information that Professor Chipeta is actually highlighting on is uh, based on uh, some recent researches of which was actually part of the researching team which has been actually done and of course uh, these are the findings that he is sharing with us so that is the way it is so I, I, I say so for the sake of Mr. Darlington in Livingstone who was asking why is it that Livingston has got so many mosquitoes and yet health uh, healthcare providers keep on emphasizing that Livingstone is malaria free. What is the connection? And I've heard that question, especially even here in Lusaka, where Lusaka has been uh, declared a free malaria zone. And yet when you look at areas like Olympia, L Rhodes Park, Ngombe, Unza, and of course other surrounding areas, Garden, there are so many mosquitoes in there. So now, what is the link there? So those are some of the issues that Professor Chipeta was actually highlighting on. Now, Professor, even before I can get back to the messages here, mm -hmm. how is the diagnosis of malaria done in a child? Good. So the diagnosis of malaria in a child is, first and foremost, I think we should really thank, you know, uh, our health systems, you know. I think the past, you know, governments for the past 10, 15 years have done a lot, you know, uh, in terms of making sure that uh, diagnosis of malaria is actually spread out throughout the country, that each health facility that you have should have the capacity to diagnose malaria. And I think this has been mainly by the, you know, very, very, I would say, uh, appreciable work that the National Malaria, you know, control program and control center which now actually has been renamed the National Malaria Elimination Center have done in the past you know a uh, few years or so uh, by scaling up the diagnostic services. The one that have made much more difference is what I just mentioned earlier on the rapid diagnostic test. Now in most if not all health facilities they have the capacity to diagnose malaria because of that rapid diagnostic test. But alongside that also, in the past years, they have done what I would call more of in-service training of laboratory technicians for malaria mic microscopy. So where there is electricity, there is power, the facilities can do microscopy and actually make a slide and actually the microscopy makes you see the parasite, you know, from the blood of a person you suspect to have malaria. So the diagnosis of malaria really is in two ways. One, the symptoms and signs that either the parent of a child or the patient themselves, if they are adults, can notice in themselves. And the health worker, like myself, will do that clinical evaluation, see what signs and symptoms of are consistent with malaria in the patient. But coupled with that, I will request that a blood test be done in terms of microscopy and actually confirm that yes, there is malaria parasite. Or a rapid diagnostic test, which is more or less like the test that uh, we use for HIV. Okay? You put a drop on a strip, okay, and the strip will show you bands. If it shows you two bands, it means there is actually malaria. Okay, so that's how the diagnosis of malaria is. It's by clinical assessment, but also confirmed by a laboratory, you know, confirmation. The other thing that also we ought to emphasize on the diagnosis is what I've just said here, symptom signs and blood tests, either by rapid diagnostic test or microscopy, are just on one hand. But also in severe cases, we need to do more laboratory evaluation in terms of to say, yes, does this child have severe malaria 
with let's say hypoglycemia so we need to check for blood glucose does this child have severe malaria and is actually anemic and needs blood transfusion we need to check the child is see hb by laboratory test does this child have severe malaria and actually is maybe going into you know kidney failure we need to check what is the kidney function like is it the kidney functions failing and so we need to do further laboratory tests so that's how the full diagnosis of malaria is we should not stop just at making a diagnosis of malaria but we should say is it a severe one is it a complicated case of malaria or not and that needs further laboratory uh, tests interesting um, another text here with no name here says, uh, why is it that uh, malaria kills more people in Africa than in Europe? Okay. Yeah. So, well, of course, malaria will kill, you know, people more here than in Europe because first and foremost, Europe will hardly have any malaria, okay? Uh, uh, but probably the question could also be extended, why is the malaria in Africa so fatal? Okay? So you will be you know, not, you know, made to know that the parasites that cause malaria are actually of four types. And there's even a fifth one now, okay? Uh, but the, the traditional ones are four types. And we tend in Africa to have the type that is very, very fatal, very, very bad type of parasite, which we call Plasmodium fasciparum. The other three called Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, okay, and Plasmodium malaria, they are not so common here in Zambia, and they are less severe in the, when they cause uh, malaria. They are more, quite much prevalent in places of our, of our friends like in India, in Brazil, uh, vivax and all that. But here in Africa, we predominantly have the Plasmodium fasciparum which tends to be the most virulent of the four parasites that we have that cause malaria. And that should really answer the question of why the African malaria seem to be very fatal. It's because the type of parasite that we have is the most deadly parasite. I've not suffered um, from malaria for the past uh, 25 years. So in line with uh, this one, this is good actually, I mm, think, 25 yeah. years, no malaria. No malaria. Really. So now, yeah. for me, it raises quite a lot of questions. Yeah. Does it mean that this person has got a very strong immune system mm. or he is not, he's just immune yeah. to mosquito bites? Yeah. Good. So, well, I'm supposing he's asking that question with a very clear fact that he's not sleeping under mosquito nets. Mm -hmm. He's not in a... An, a you know, in a uh, a home where regularly, you know, there is IRS that is uh, indoor residuals spraying against mosquitoes. But despite all those measures, which maybe he's not having, he's still saying he has not suffered from malaria. That's very much possible. Okay, um, I would have, if it was on a direct phone call, I would have asked him to say, "What is your blood group?" Okay, uh, besides the fact that factors like you know mosquito nets that is you know insecticide treated mosquito nets and iris can protect one from malaria your body own makeup in terms of the immune system your genetics or your trait your hereditary trait from your parents can naturally protect you from malaria and we do know that you know individuals of certain blood groups like blood group o and so they tend to be resistant to malaria. There is a very well-founded fact in West Africa where the Flani area uh, uh, in, I think it was Burkina Faso, so there was one tribe neighboring for another tribe. One tribe's children, they were dying of malaria like normal body's business. The other tribe, they were hardly having any under five deaths. And so the other tribe thought maybe this tribe they are witch. They are making their, you know, friends' children die of ma uh, they didn't know it was malaria. But actually it was the fact that the other tribe had the gene genetic makeup that is protective of malaria. So it's true that some people can be resistant to malaria 
naturally because they are carrying gene traits that are protective against malaria. There is a so-called the DAFI, you know, that is very protective and tends to be those with certain blood group that carry that. And naturally, you are protected from malaria in that sense. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Chpeta and your host. Uh, please emphasize on uh, people to do a slight test for malaria before commencement of uh, medication. I say so because uh, I've seen a lot of uh, people put themselves on medication after catching a fever. This one is coming through from Titus Kapasa from uh, Kawe. Now, in line with this observation, I would also want to throw in my own observation really to you. Um, what's the link between malaria and fever and vice versa and is it is it automatic that when somebody has got a fever then they also have m m malaria if a child has got a fever is it automatic that that child has got malaria or is it and is it also automatic that if a child has got malaria you expect a fever because in most cases what makes people administer uh self-medication and parents get caffeinos and so on so on and so forth and administer to their children is because of a fever itself yeah exactly yeah. So uh, I think that is a very important, uh, we can answer the question from, you know, the point of view that you have just emphasized in terms of uh, fever and malaria, what is really the connection? And then we come to answer Titus to do with, uh, you know, the em emphasis that malaria should be treated only when it's confirmed by, you know, testing for it. I agree totally with Titus, and that's what I area on, you know, emphasize that not all fever in children, okay, and maybe even worse in adults is malaria. And if we just empirically treat ourselves or self-treat us because we have fever without testing for malaria, then we are actually, you know, just mistreating ourselves. Uh, and there are dangers for that which I will mention just shortly. Now, fever is almost the invaluable symptom of malaria for one specific reason. Because the parasite, when it's in the blood, it attacks, as we said, the red blood cells. But besides that, it evokes your body defense to react to it. And the body defense reacts to it by producing certain chemicals that are actually, you know, they potently push up your body temperature, okay? So there's hardly any time when you can have malaria and not have fever, okay? So if you are feeling general body malaise, which malaria causes and all those things, but you don't have fever, most likely it may not be malaria because malaria by its nature, by evoking your body defenses, by your immune system, it will push your body temperature up, okay? Of course, we have very exceptional cases where individuals that are, their immune system is totally suppressed, like in case of HIV and all that, they may not raise temperature so much, but that is really at the severe end of HIV. But generally, any confirmed malaria infection will produce fever. Okay. So that direct link is explained on that basis. Now, back to Titus. Why self-medication is wrong, you know, to do with malaria is that we are currently towards campaign to eliminate malaria. And one of the factors that may delay us not eliminate malaria is if we have drug re resistance to malaria. If we push up drug resistance to malaria, it means then the, the uh, anti-malaria drugs that we are using will be rendered useless. They won't cure the parasite. Why? Because of misuse okay uh, of the drugs so if we treat ourselves with anti malaria when we don't have malaria we are just actually going to make those you know uh, drugs become resistant or the, mm. uh, the parasite become resistant to those drugs on one hand on the other hand also which i made an emphasis for children if we self-medicate we might be under treating under dosing the children that again will encourage resistance, uh, drug resistance developing, and therefore we will fail indeed to eliminate malaria because we'll have all these problems to do with drug resistance. So 
I agree with Titus. Every one of us, especially children, when they have signs and symptoms of malaria, we ought to promptly rush them so that the diagnosis of malaria is confirmed and then they are put on appropriate treatment. Another observation, Professor, is that, you know, when malaria is moving uh, from one member of the family to the other in a family, mm -hmm. uh, there is that general belief that, you know, when malaria enters into the house, it wants to make sure that it rotates, that's when it actually lives. Mm -hmm. Now, I've seen parents administer medication even to other children who are not sick mm -hmm. in a bid to prevent them from uh, catching malaria. Exactly. I don't know how wise that is. I don't know how effective that is. Is there something like, no, you take medication in advance, even be, in, in case malaria comes, it definitely finds that you're already protected. Mm. Yeah, so I think that would be, I mean, I would say that uh, uh, on one hand, one would look at it as if it's a very prudent thing to do. But on the other hand, for us who are in a malaria endemic area, it's not prudent for the very reason I've talked about Mm -hmm. pushing up drug resistance okay there will be one time probably maybe soon whereby like it was in the 70s where f for example Saka will be totally malaria free okay so that those of us who live in Osaka if I'm going to my village in Lundazi I may be put on malaria prophylaxis or preventive treatment which usually we recommend and we always recommend for our visitors who are coming from non-malaria endemic areas like Europe, America, when they come here, they have to be on malaria uh, a preventive, a preventive treatment. Okay. Also, we do the same also in terms of uh, pregnant women. We actually put them in some sort of uh, malaria prophylaxis. Though for pregnant women, it's actually presumptive treatment. They are on a full course of, you know, treatment as if we have confirmed that they have malaria when they're pregnant because we don't want them to, to succumb to any malaria because of the nature of the pregnancy. And mind you, the other thing that might, I might have forgotten in terms of children is that the malaria can cause dangerous things even to the unborn child, a child that is still being carried in the womb, in that if a pregnant woman has malaria, that child, the likelihoodness of the child, be, be, you know, being born premature is very high. Being born with it, low birth weight is very high. Actually, pregnancy being lost is also very high. So malaria is very devastating as far as children are concerned, both the children that are, you know, born and alive and those that are unborn. So it's that much severe. So we need to be careful in terms of prophylaxis. Prophylaxis for malaria is not recommended for us in endemic countries. If me from Lusaka going to, to you know, to Northern Province or Apula or to my village, the most preventive, effective way and prudent is that I should sleep on a, in a insecticide-treated mosquito net. I should either use repellents, I should either make sure that, you know, where I'm going, uh, there is maybe you know, end all residuals, played homes and all that. But for personal, use repellents, use a mosquito net, other than swallowing drugs because, you know, the chances of us having parastemia is so much high and the chances then of pushing drug resistance if we use this prophylaxis treatment is, you know, is quite high. As a uh, P perhaps I'd love you to respond to the two questions, really. Mm -hmm. um, this one says, um, whenever I... Uh, uh, good afternoon, doctor. My mm -hmm. question is for malaria testing. Mm -hmm. Whenever I go to the clinic, malaria is not found. Is that normal? And I have got a friend as well, mm -hmm. who's... Uh, the child has been showing signs of malaria mm -hmm. and uh, high fever, especially mm -hmm. as we approach the evenings. Mm -hmm but he's been moving from one clinic to the next and nothing is being found. Mm -hmm. What could be the problem there? Mm -hmm. Then how about if the RDT shows negative? Mm -hmm. Can that person be put on treatment? Okay, yeah. So first and foremost, let's go back to what I had said about um, the fact that not all fever mm -hmm. may be malaria. And that also applies to other symptoms of malaria, especially in children, because children are prone to many other 
you know, diseases, childhood diseases. I talked about acute diarrhea disease. I talked about pneumonia. I talked about upper respiratory tract infection, especially tonsils. I talked about, you know, urinary tract infection. So I'm hoping that that child who every evening has had this fever has been really assessed very, very comprehensively. If it was at a health center, I would suggest that, you know, uh, the next time they go there, probably the child be referred to a hospital where a doctor could, you know, uh, have a second opinion on what is going on. Because also we have, you know, fevers that can go along for a longer time. We call persistent fever or pers recurrent fever. And that those could be for even more dangerous, you know, infections like TB. Okay? And we'll be saying, okay, fever, fever, maybe it's uh, TB. Or it could be like in our case now, most of our towns we have these outbreaks of typhoid. It could be typhoid, and you have typhoid. The fever will be just going on. You do a malaria test. Of course, it will be negative. Okay. Or in some very very uh, dire situations, the fever could be pointing to other diseases like it, cancers in children, blood cancers. So I would rather that child is thoroughly evaluated. If not at a health center, probably taken to a hospital. Now, there's also an area question of, you know, the RDT. The RDT being negative. If the RDT is being negative, and microscopy also has been counterchecked, they are both negative. I would encourage, you know, the patient to say yes, you don't have malaria, most likely. Okay. Of course, they are very, and I don't want to mention this, but they are very, very, in you know, uh, very exceptional cases where the RDT may be, you know, falsely negative. But that's very, very rare. You know, our National Malaria Elimination in, in Control Center have been very, very, I would say, pragmatic in terms of making sure that you know the supply of our RDTs are of the best quality. Okay. Uh, and also, we have gone countrywide, you know, orienta orienting our health workers how to keep our diagnostic tools, you know, with the efficacy, I mean, efficacy, you know, being intact. Because there are certain, you know, conditions that can make the RDT not work very well. But the keeping of RDT is in such a way that, you know, their efficacy in, is maintained. So if an RDT is negative, Take it to be negative. If you think you suspect, no, 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 it could be malaria, do a microscopy. If it's negative, really, uh, it's, let's search for something else that is causing that fever or is that causing that symptom that is suggestive of malaria, but it could be, you know, some other disease that is being, you know, uh, uh, mimicked as malaria. Well, Professor, how I wish we could uh, go Very on and on. Great. Unfortunately, time is not on our side today. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for making time to come and share with us this vital information on uh, malaria. Yeah, I also appreciate, I think, as Zambia Pediatric Association, it's good that we have engaged us because we want to really raise the awareness uh, in terms of children. And the children are, as I, I told you, 46.4% of our populations are children under 15. And the majority of those children, you know, they need, you know, to be cared for. And if we raise awareness in terms of childhood illnesses, we will have our population, you know, uh, really healthy. And we really thank that QTV has engaged Zambia Pediatric Association to have these opportunities to share with our, the public, uh, as well as the welfare of the children is concerned, their health. You know, yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, I know quite a lot of questions came through and of course uh, quite a lot of uh, feedback as well came through from all across uh, the country, Kitwe, Livingstone, Chipata, Lusaka and of course other areas. Otherwise, thank you so much. But be sure that we are going to create a part two for this discussion so that we can also respond on other concerns. I, I could see from the messages that were other concerns, for example, what is being done to eliminate uh, the ever-growing population of mosquitoes 
in some parts of the country and of course uh, how is um, the indoor residual spraying program going on is it effective is it helping in uh, eradicating mosquitoes and also reducing the cases of uh, malaria in uh, malaria prone areas and of course others as well but time couldn't be with us today but we'll make sure that we create another Sunday where we can come and uh, tackle these vital uh, issues as well otherwise for today that does it thank you so much for your time make sure that you join us next week sunday between 13 and 14 for another exciting edition of uh, your health talk and uh, be sure that possibly next week uh, next week we might actually zero into the discussion of uh, tuberculosis as well so ask the pediatrician is there to make sure that we raise awareness in terms of uh, issues relating to a child's health so make sure that you don't miss every single sunday as we come through with various pediatricians from different institutions i've been your host nelson zulu with ask the pediatrician until next week it's bye-bye